Hello and welcome back. So what I want to do today is continue talking about shielding by looking at a rather unconventional shield. So it's unconventional not because of its shielding properties, it does have that, but rather because of the way it looks. So it's not a standard shielding enclosure, but rather you'll find this being implemented in various circuitry as a copper band around your switching power converter transformer. Now this thing is called a flux band or sometimes referred to as a belly band and it's a form of magnetic shielding and what I want to do today is look at how this thing works and try to measure what sort of benefits can you get from using this approach. So if you're curious about that and much more then keep watching. Now first to understand how this thing works, we need to remember a few things about transformers and magnetic induction. Now the basic principle by which an electric transformer works is that we have a primary inductor where under the influence of a variable current we are generating a magnetic flux, so a time variable magnetic flux, which then passes through a secondary inductor where the flux gets turned into a current again by magnetic induction. Now, in an ideal world, all of the flux generated in the primary will get turned into a current in the secondary, so we will be getting a coupling factor of 1. But in the real world, that doesn't really happen. Most of the flux gets turned into a current on the secondary side, but some of the magnetic flux leaks out, so we won't really get an ideal coupling factor of 1. And this will be the main effect in which we are interested in today. And to start to understand why some of the magnetic flux will be leaking out, let's start with an experiment. So what I got here are two concentric coils, both having 150 turns, which well form a transformer. And we can measure the coupling factor by measuring the variation of the inductance of one of the inductors when the other inductor is on the one side an open circuit and on the other side in a short circuit. So right now I have my inner inductor connected to my inductance meter showing about 250 microhenry. And at the moment the outer inductor is in an open circuit. But now if we put this into a short circuit we can see our inductance drops to 214 microhenry. And from this we can work out that our coupling factor is about 30%. So can we improve on this if we add a bigger secondary inductor? So now I change the second inductor with another 150 turn inductor which has a larger diameter. And again we can perform the same experiment. So we have 249 microhenries on the inner inductor when the second inductor is in an open circuit. And when the second inductor is short circuited, we drop down to only 247 microhenry. So we have a very small variation, leading us to a very small coupling factor. So now we only have 10% coupling. So what's going on? Why does increasing the diameter make things worse? Well, to understand what's going on, we need to go back to that magnetic flux thing. So what I got here is a drawing of our transformer in a cross section. So these circles are a cross section through our inductors. So we have our inner inductor, our second inductor and our third inductor. And our inner inductor is generating the magnetic flux. So we have our flux lines that close back on the outside. So magnetic flux is going one way on the inside of the inductor and then the other way on the outside of the inductor. Now if we turn our attention to one of the secondary inductors, so let's say inductor 2, the current that will be induced into inductor 2 is dependent on the magnetic flux going through the inside of this inductor. And what we can see is that we have a lot of magnetic flux going one way and some magnetic flux going the other way. And now the current that's being induced into an inductor is dependent on the direction of the field lines. 
So going one way will generate a positive current, going the other way will generate a negative current. But with this inductor, we have field lines going both ways. And we can't really induce a positive and a negative current at the same time. So what happens is that the field lines that go both ways cancel each other out. So the only magnetic flux that will induce a current into the second inductor is magnetic flux that only goes one way inside of it and the other way outside. So not all of the flux that our primary is generating can induce a current into the secondary. And in the same way, if we look now to our third inductor, well, even more of the initial flux is being cancelled out and even less of it is passing outside of the inductor so that it can generate a current inside of it. So as we move further away from our inner inductor, the amount of magnetic flux that couples between the primary and the secondary reduces. So our inductor coupling reduces and more of the initial flux, well, leaks without generating a useful current in our secondary side. So what can be done about this? Well, the common approach is the addition of a magnetic core. So a core made out of a magnetically permeable material, which has a magnetic permeability much higher than the air around it. So the magnetic field lines prefer to go through the core rather than through the air around. And by this approach, transformers with coupling factors above 95% are easily obtainable. But the system isn't perfect. You still don't get 100%. So you still have some field lines that close in between the inductors. So not all of the magnetic flux closes through the magnetic core. And well, if some field lines close inside it, then some will close outside of it. Now, from a transformer's performance point of view, the field lines that close outside of the core are not really a problem. So these will also be inducing current into our secondary inductor, but they will also be inducing problems into the circuitry around the transformer. So the magnetic emissions generated by a transformer are caused by these escaping field lines. And especially in very high power transformers, these external emissions can have a direct effect on circuitry around the transformer. So in extreme cases, causing the circuitry to malfunction, and they can also be the direct cause of failed emissions tests either by the direct emissions levels or by inducing other secondary effects like common mode currents and causing problems in that way. So it's sometimes very important to do something about these fields going outside of the transformer. So before attempting to reduce the transformer's emissions, first we need to measure a baseline. And for that, I prepared the setup right here. So what I got here is an old phone charger that I'm supplying from a DC power supply and I'm measuring the input voltage 188 volts running at about 22 milliamps. And then on the output we have 5.3 volts running into a 10 ohm resistor. So we have a fixed load. And then in the back we have our spectrum analyzer with a magnetic field probe to measure the emissions. And what I have here among some other noise is our clear switching frequency. So we have our first peak at around 133 kilohertz, then the first harmonic at 260 kilohertz, and then the next harmonic at 390 kilohertz, and so on. So the measurement is performed between 50 kilohertz and one megahertz. And I will be saving this measurement for further reference. Now, the next step is to do something about these emissions. And this is where the flux band comes into play. So if we come back to our drawing, our problems are caused by the field lines going outside of the transformer. And one thing that we could try to do about them is to try to convert these into heat by creating a single turn inductor that only absorbs these field lines. So we need to add an inductor that will not turn our useful flux into a current, but only this external flux. And this can be done by wrapping a band of copper around our transformer. So we can add this single turn on the exterior of our transformer, and this will only convert into a current the magnetic flux that goes through the transformer and back on the outside of the inductor. So this useful magnetic flux in the core that is going both ways 
will be cancelled out and will not create an effect on our external band. Now commonly a band of copper is added and soldered into a single turn for two main reasons. So copper has very good electrical conductivity and well you can solder it. If you would be using something like aluminum then soldering it would be a much more difficult process. So to make the modification easy I added the socket on the board so that the transformer can be easily removed and reinserted and in the meantime I also added the flux band. So it's a simple copper band going around the transformer and it's soldered in one point. So this is a continuous single turn inductor on the outside of the transformer. So now I place the transformer onto the board and let's turn things on to see how this behaves. So we can see our same frequency peaks appearing as before. So we see our 133 kilohertz, the 260 and the 390 kilohertz peaks all showing up. So we still have the same emissions. Now it's important to also mention that the results that you will get are highly dependent on the position of the field probe. So if I let this run and move the probe around, we can have completely different results. So we can go up, we can go down, it's highly position dependent. So when making near field probe measurements, this is a topic to keep in mind. You will not always get perfect repeatability of your measurements. But to get a clearer view of how this behaves, so if it's better or worse than before, let's compare the two measurements on the computer. So what we can see here is that there's quite a lot of noise in both of the measurements and I can't honestly say that my probe is only picking up magnetic fields. There's also an electric field component in here and well that's what you get when you make your own probes. But regardless we can clearly see our fundamental switching frequency and its two harmonics and we can notice that our fundamental frequency went down by about 10 decibels. So by adding the flux band, at least the noise coming from the fundamental switching frequency of the converter was reduced. Now we can also see that all this low frequency component went down by quite a lot, so more than 10 decibels, but we also see an increase in higher frequencies. And this can be partly attributed to the fact that our flux band was left electrically floating. So it works like a floating electric field shield. Now I did try grounding it and that didn't really help so anyway. Now it's important to mention that the converter that I tested was only providing 2.5 watts so very little amount of power and the addition of a flux band is common in converters running above 100 watts. So with this sort of very low power converter magnetic fields are not really the main noise source. But as power increases in your converter, magnetic fields start to become quite an important problem that needs to be handled. So part of the reason why the noise reduction wasn't so obvious was that the converter is running at such low powers. Now if we look at the power consumption of the converter, we can also notice an interesting thing. The power consumption with or without the flux band didn't really change. So this proves to us that the flux escaping the transformer compared to the flux going through the transformer is very very small. So with some more precise measurement equipment you might be able to observe just how much flux is escaping but for me this was not obvious. So I also tried to measure the coupling factor between the primary side and an external flux band but I couldn't measure anything. So we can safely say that coupling to the external flux band is below 1%. So the addition of a flux band will have very limited effects on the transformer's performance. Now if you want to implement such a measure in your design, so to add a flux band to your transformer, there are a few things to mention about this. So on the one side the flux band is a band of conductive material, so copper usually. And it's an unisolated structure. So there's no isolation on top of it, you have exposed conductive copper. And especially at transformers running at high voltages, this raises safety issues. So you need to take into account your clearance and creepage distances when applying this sort of measure. That's why commonly you won't see flux bands that are extremely wide, so there is a lot of space but they won't fill up all the space, rather they will be much thinner. 
and this is done to ensure the safety distances between the flux band and the primary and secondary side so you don't have some sort of arcing or any sort of hazards. Now in practical implementations the flux bands can be left floating or grounded and by grounding them they will provide a bit more shielding but that's not always necessary. So depending on your design you may or may not want to ground your flux band. And a final thing to mention is that this is a very good last minute fix. So what I mean by this is that if you're developing a product, you design it, you buy the components, the boards, you assemble it, and usually only afterwards you perform some compliance tests. And if at that moment you figure out that you have a problem, well, you got a big problem. Because while well, your design is done, your boards are ordered, everything is assembled, and well, you have a non-compliant product, so you can't really sell it. And the thing about the flux band compared to something like a proper shield is that it can be added without any sort of major modifications to your design. So you don't need to provide any sort of special place on the board or anything. You can simply add it on top of the transformer and it's there and it will do its job. So this sort of measure can be easily implemented without major changes to your design. And if you only exceed emissions by a small amount, well, this might just save your design. So in the end, the flux band can be quite an effective way of reducing transformer emissions and it's a measure that can be added easily without major modifications to a design. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.